as the head of the Fusion Experience team, Mr. Pat Dent is responsible for driving and executing the Fusion strategy across the technology, marketing, and business functions, as well as directing AMD strategy and collaboration in engaging the computing ecosystem to shape the next generation of devices, environments, tools, and applications, experiences made possible by the AMD Fusion family of APUS. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Manju Hackdown for the, the keynote speech of uh, unleashing the full power of the PC software development for AMD Fusion APUS. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Manju Hackdown. GPUs have only been used for gaming today and 
the rest of my talk I'll be giving you lots of evidence that affect video, augmented reality, content management, all of them are developed on the GPU and will extend to the second GPU. So not only do GPUs and APUs make GPU matter, think of the, to use a restaurant analogy, think of the APU as an appetizer. It whets your appetite for more graphics performance and of course appetizers, the reason why restaurants have it is that you tend to eat more of the entree. So people have, have said, well, once you introduce the APU, won't it affect your discrete GPU market? Absolutely not. Because that has been solved by the industry. Anybody who likes an experience or a performance gets more of it with their initial GPU. So that's kind of my entire strategy set. So now, we actually launched our first Fusion APU in, at CES in January. So we now have a history. What have the results been? I think the results from our point of view have been just outstanding. The first Fusion APU, a low power APU, the demand has been just tremendous. It has a tremendous amount of compute capacity, about 100 gigaflops for the first one. What's even more interesting is the second one which we are about to launch and for which we made some uh, sneak previews. We have nearly half a teraflops of compute capability which are usable by developers and I'll talk about applications that are already using that kind of compute capability. And yet, we talk about all day power. This might be a little paradoxical. You, you normally you don't get more performance without having more power. Again, think of it, it's the GPU, right? So, not only did we do lots of optimization on the CPU portion, but a lot of applications use the GPU. So, GPUs typically have about a 5 to 8x performance for what advantage. So, now you not only have an experience advantage, you have a power advantage. In fact, the battery life is always amazing that half a drop of machine with all day power battery life. I met a lot of OEMs this weekend. They have challenged me and they've proven that we can do all day battery life with half a teraflop. And then the ecosystem, as I said, most important to us. This is the first year. And we want developers to know all the advancements that we are making and the tools that we are providing so that they can continue to develop with these increasing compute capabilities. So this is our strategy. I mean, this is going to be our strategy for the next foreseeable future. We are going to the three aspects to it. We are targeting both commercial and consumer end users. We are looking, if you look at what are the kind of applications and the area, the categories of experience that they target, consumers broadly are video, graphics, and compute. And compute is the wild card. Compute can be essentially used to do all kinds of things that hitherto were not possible. And so in compute, we typically see that small startup companies, VC funded startup companies, are the aggressive ones because they need to make a mark. And having you know, this unprecedented amount of compute capability is something that they can innovate upon. And the commercial space is productivity, it's collaboration, very big words and which have started from the consumer space and moved into the commercial space and security. And interestingly, the compute capability of GPUs can address all of them. In today's talk, most of my examples will be from the consumer space. We started working in the space of commercial ISVs and we've seen some of these performance enhancements that I've talked about. But let's look at the first and the, set of the third aspects of the strategy. Leveraging industry standards. That has been a key theme from AMD for the last, I don't know, 10 years. AMD, as a rule, does not like to create a new standard because we believe that we do not want software developers who are critical for our success to have to do anything unnatural. So the standards we support are OpenCL, DirectX, OpenGL, WebGL, all the ones that the industry has accepted. So therefore, when a software developer develops something, he doesn't have to do a separate port for us and a separate port for our competitors. And then lastly, I'll talk about how we are driving the ecosystem. But first, let me address, I want to reinforce that point about industry standards. In general, the PC industry is a cooperative industry. That's why we call it an ecosystem. No one person does everything. And that's why it's so critical that you follow industry standards. However, there is a history in the PC industry of many proprietary standards, and people want to innovate. When you have a consensual behavior, it's never fast enough for the innovator. So they innovate. But the history of the PC industry is what? Innovation succeed, they drive the market, but then the rest of the ecosystem comes in and 
creates a standard, and that's the one that allows the exponential growth, which is what the PC industry needs. So this is a truism that I'm just reinforcing to you, and I'm just giving you examples in the last 12 years, 15 years. And so all, 3DFX is like the APM from 3DFX, CG from NVIDIA, then RAM versus memory, because all of them started a trend, the rest of the industry said this is, this is interesting, let's scale it and get it to the standard. And the reason I bring that up is because you know, we are big supporters of OpenCL. The industry has embraced OpenCL and the, I mean, CUDA, I came from NVIDIA actually last year, so I was the GM of CUDA, so I know what I'm talking about. CUDA is definitely a very innovative API, but I think OpenCL is definitely going to get to scale sooner than CUDA. I think uh, ARM is supporting it. Apple is supporting it, and you know, there's a list of everybody that and NVIDIA supports it. So that's the point I want to make. Then the third aspect of our strategy is driving the software ecosystem. So I've broken it up into four categories of actions on our part. Think of these as chronological. The leftmost one is ISV support. My team has some of the best engineers in AMD. We work with application developers across the world both consumer, commercial, and actually in the server space, but today I'm just talking about the client space. And we give them technical support, you know, we give them early roadmap drops, and we also have invested significantly in tools so that they can extract that compute capacity that we've been packaging for them in our chips. So that's today's application and next year's application. But as I said, we know our roadmap to 2040. We are going to keep increasing this compute capability. So therefore, it's really important for us to have innovation. And the way we're doing that, one way we are stimulating that is, last year we announced a future fund in Computex. We've been very happy with the results so far. We've, got, we've made several investments. We haven't announced any publicly. We will start announcing them as soon as the company starts shipping products. because so that is our gate to announcement. And that has helped with some of the new uses of that you know, half a teraflop compute capability, for example. And then lastly, is the really futuristic thing because the fusion fund companies typically will have applications coming out in a two-year time frame. But we are interested in three years and beyond too. So therefore, we have renewed our focus on innovation in the universities. That's the most furthest out. And we, we fund research too, but this initiative I'm talking about is to commercialize the existing research within universities so that you can have spin-outs from universities because a lot of VC funded companies, if you look at the roots of where that innovation came, it came from somebody who dropped out of school. And this is historically true. Look at Google, look at Apple, look at Microsoft. Same thing is true today. Many people drop out of school. And also university professors. There's a history of university professors creating successful companies. So we're encouraging that at the university level. So that's a chronological way in which we're driving the software ecosystem. So now, for some of the proof. As I said, we launched our first Fusion APU at CES. At that point, there was zero install base. Now think about that. You got a new architecture, CPU and GPU with the OpenCL, which is still not as easy to program the GPU as a CPU today. We are fast changing that, but we have to acknowledge that. So you would think that introducing new architecture with zero install base, why would a software developer develop to that? The answer is the vision that I explained has been by and large fought by the innovators in the industry. So when we launched, we had at least 25 applications that used the APU. And these were not for all from small companies, companies such as Roby, companies such as Cyberlink, uh, application from Adobe, Microsoft. They used the compute capability of the APU. And when I say the compute capability of the APU, now I'm not just talking about GPU compute, I'm talking about video, graphics, and compute. Those are the three different kinds of compute that we use so I think our scorecard is definitely at least a B plus for getting so many applications available on day one with zero install base. Now we come to our the powerful fusion, the A series that we're about to launch. And this is about 5x in performance of the previous one. That was 100 gigaflops and a half a terabyte, 500 gigaflops. So you'd expect that there'd be much more powerful application and the expectation would be correct. And here, we are categorizing the application into brilliant HD, by which we, we mean any video application, video playback, video management, video processing, content management. Then there is what we call personal supercomputing applications. These are the ones where hitherto you couldn't 
when you didn't have anything close to this kind of capability, so that software developers didn't do that. So these are typically some small companies, aggressive companies, most of the time VC funded, who want to make a name for themselves by showing an application that people want but can, haven't been able to have, and then scale wide. And then lastly, the capability is all their battery power. This is really important to us because we want to rely on the fact that people expect that performance always comes at a cost of power. But because of the APU architecture, we're able to counterbalance that more performance and actually get less power. So the half a teraflop is at tens of watts. So now with that big drum roll, let me show you some of the applications. So in terms of the brilliant HP, as I said, it's for video anything. We've got an IE9, which is you know, the big release from Microsoft. They finally use the GPU in a very, very meaningful way and makes the browser experience so much better. Office 2010 is a productivity application, and that uses the GPU in a very significant way. In fact, if you didn't catch it, that means go back. This transition uses the GPU in a very significant way, and there's lots of other aspects of PowerPoint that uses this PowerPoint 2010. uses the GPU significantly. We have a system monitor, and if you look at the GPU utilization and these transitions are going on, you require some good graphics capability. Then Windows Live for some of the UI interfaces and for the media player. And Silverlight, they're also going to be using some of the hardware including in GPU. So Microsoft is definitely a big believer in the, in the use of GPU for enhancing the consumer experience. On strong Microsoft applications, Adobe Flash Player is a very important one. They've got 99.9% .9 coverage of the PC industry. The 10.1, 10.2, and now 10.3 all use the APU. And they use them in the post process, make the streaming video much better than the source was by doing edge enhancement, color balance, anti shake filters. We have a ton of filters that we put in our driver, so when you're watching Flash on an AMD APU, you can actually have a better experience with the source video for Telegram. Similarly, the DVD players from, say, Arkstar, Cyberlink, Corel, and there's a ton of them, these are some of the partners that I could just talk on my head recall. Gaming, you know, that should be a natural one. But here again, we, have, we want to point out a difference. DX11 is now about two years old, and so in the last two years, there have been some titles which have been DX11, but now it's becoming mainstream. So almost every major game and some not so major games are coming out with DX11. DX11 has some natural advantages. It has some features like tessellation that really appeal to the end user. It actually has also inherent performance advantages. The DX11 pipeline is just more efficient. And then it can use compute. So that means if you want to render something and you want to do a little enhancement, it's much easier. Within the same API, you use the compute functionality. So DX11 is really important. And the gaming companies have shown that. So let me show you a couple of examples. But first, I wanted to mention one of the things that we get with the Fusion MPU is because we use a discrete level GPU, you get full DX11 capability in a very, very small form factor, the kind of form factor that you would normally play only online browser-based games. Now you can play the full gaming experience that typically you would have bought a discrete 3D card for available on the APU. Yet, when you add a discrete GPU, you can turn on much more features. So there will be some people, like I said, it's the appetizer versus the entree analogy. I actually got some visual evidence of how DX11 is better than the previous API. You can see the tessellation on the style it almost doesn't look like the same object. So you can see the one on the right is just a still. And imagine what it would do in an actual interactive 3D model. This is a still and you can see the difference. And then in terms of gameplay, this is an example from Shogun. You can actually see something missing, like the cloud is missing. So that can actually affect your experience of the game itself. It's not just a pure quality in terms of eye candy, it's affecting gameplay. It's subtle, but nevertheless there in many games. And then finally, as I mentioned, the X11 just has better performance. So if you see a couple of games, which they have a fallback, and you look at the DS9 fallback versus the DS11 version of the same game, about 20-30% improvement in performance in terms of per second. In fact, one of these has allowed us to show you a sneak preview of a recently released game. This is from Dirt 3.
billions dollars in development. And normally you could only get that kind of experience with a beefy industry GPU. That works really well on the AMD ACD APUs. Full frame rate, uncompromised quality. In fact, the laptop I'm making this presentation on this is the one with the Sabine system, early version. And as I said, they'll be available on the, on the market pretty soon. So now, let's go to, I talked about the value of PS11. Not only is it open, but it's got some features that, is, that are even better than its previous version. Now let's talk about OpenCL. Why do developers want OpenCL? One is it's an open standard, supported by almost the entire industry, getting a lot of traction by the month. Secondly, it's cross-platform, not only across vendors, which is what the openness gives you, but the interesting thing about OpenCL is it's cross-platform across processors. So OpenCL in an APU works on the CPU portion as well as the GPU portion. Why is that important? Well, because you know, there are certain workloads which don't lend themselves to the GPU architecture. They're not heavily data parallel. They're very branching, sequential, very logic bound. So you can dynamically transfer that load. And we actually have applications doing that. And that's really a boon. Because in other APIs, for instance, in uh, CUDA, this was not possible. And they're trying to move into that. But this is spec to be transferable between CPU and GPU. And then lastly, you can transfer this because of the workload, but sometimes you can transfer this just to balance the power. Because as I said, the GPU is just more power efficient. So if the workload can decide on both, and very often in IC you can transfer it just to reduce the power and improve the battery life while playing that application. So now in terms of OpenCL, the application that we target are these personal supercomputing applications. The Sony Vegas Pro at the NAB show, I think a month ago, announced that they were shipping the OpenCL version. This is in a content management and editor which has an encoder in it. The encoder uses OpenCL. A Vivo View Room is a startup and that uses multi party video conferencing, full 1080p, can support an unlimited number of uh, parties depending only on the capacity of the platform and the network bandwidth. Completely decentralized, scales really well. You're going to hear a lot about this one because it's a very compelling application. They're getting a lot of traction not only with consumers but also very large Fortune 500 companies. Viewdoom is a face recognition application where they can do face recognition from photos, but what's more interesting, they can do face recognition from video. And they got various versions of performance. So the company's application scales all the way down to a smartphone. And when you have face recognition, which is automatic, think about the kind of use cases that it allows. In fact, I might, I'll show you a video from the Google application. <laughs> This is the one that is on a smartphone. The tap on that person goes to the database, identifies that it's bad at you, all automatically. And in the case of a smartphone, you can only do it when you're taking a photo because then you've got the full frontal face view. But in the APU case, they can also do it from your know, existing videos on a hard drive. Because there you don't know what view you're getting from a person. It might be a view of you from this angle. So a lot more compute power is required. And the, you know, one application of it is, I've got my personal PC about a thousand videos. But if I ever want to find a retrieval video of the last year's Christmas party, I've got to search through all of them. It can take me three hours if I don't remember. This can run on the GPU in the background. It identifies the faces and thumbnails. So very easy for me to search through my video collection. Then motion DHP is an application which takes against the videos that you have in your hard drive, cleans them up, takes away noise, improves the lighting, improves the stabilization, and that's again a huge GPU compute usage application. And again, I'll show you a video of that. It also, by the way, creates a panorama from your videos. So those three applications are shown here, but I'll show you an actual video of the kind of difference it makes. So it's the same video process, and you can see user-generated video is very shaky. They look at multiple frames of video, use the information across frames, that's why it's a huge compute application, and then they stabilize it. So this is, for instance, all the user-generated video that you have 
today's generation is used to streaming YouTube, Hulu, Dailymotion. All that video can be stabilized, especially user generated video. So then I mentioned we're talking about the ecosystem, so you want awareness and distribution. So if you look at all these applications, there is quite a ton of technical <coughs> features, tessellation, ax 11 OpenCL driver, etc. So how do we help the ISCs by making the consumers who have our APU know that they have these advantages? We are packaging all this up into something that we call the vision engine. And this is what we are marketing to consumers through OEM. The idea is consumers don't know what they short to 64 and they should. They don't know what tessellations are and they shouldn't. We just give them one simple construct, the, the vision engine. And what the vision engine consists of are OpenCL and our VX drivers the UI to control them, and the notification of applications that are optimized for that. So that's our model for distribution and awareness of consumers to help the ISVs. And so this is, you know, we have Microsoft certified drivers, our performance with every driver update increases significantly, and it's a monthly update. And like I said, we have a notification of all the innovative applications that are available on your platform. Then lastly, as I said, we also need new ideas to flow into this ecosystem. So therefore, we put in a particular emphasis on university. We are launching a textbook on OpenCL in about a few weeks in, at the developer summit in Seattle. We have a university course, and we probably got about 50 universities already. It was five a few months ago. It's gone to 50, and we're going to shoot for a few hundred within a year. So there won't be any shortage of people who know OpenCL, GP compute, and therefore can create new applications using the compute capability that we are making available to them. And then lastly, I want to talk about this Fusion Developer Summit. It's the first developer summit AMD is inaugurated, is holding. It's in two weeks, June 30th to 16th in Seattle. We are targeting about 600 attendees. Equal balance between software developers, tools developers, and university researchers that we want that kind of uh, combination to improve the interaction. And my last slide, I want to talk to you about some of the keynote speakers there. We got the person from ARM who is developing GPU compute on the Mali graphics in the keynote. We got Microsoft's principal architect talking about their heterogeneous computing uh, and enhancements. And finally, CEO of Corel talking about which applications they are targeting OpenCL for. And our own CTOs are talking about both the APU and the GPU roadmap. So, in summary, the three messages I want you to leave with are we're having this in Seattle, and Seattle is beautiful in June. Two is, you know, VHS beat Betamax, so open standards will always win. And the last one is advertisers will make you hungry. So, that's all I want to say. Speech. Thank you so much. And our next speaker is the CEO of Opera Software, Mr. Lars Boylesson. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Lars Boylesson. Mr. Boylesson has been the CEO of Opera Software ASA of at Marvel since January 2010. And Mr. Boylesson served as the Chief Commercial Officer of Opera Software ASA. And he also served as Chief Executive Officer for Nordic and Baltic Region at Apotel Lucent. He used to serve as an Executive Vice President of Sales and Distribution of Opera Software ASA from 2000 to 2005. He has extensive sales and marketing experiences and has held executive positions in various corporations. In a very short introduction to Opera, Opera Software has always strived to develop the fastest and technologically most advanced browsers. As a result, the Opera browser is the choice of some of the world's most demanding and knowledgeable users. At the same time, when the powerful compression technology in the full browser is applied to the Opera Mini browser, the web is accessible on even the simplest, simplest handsets with small screens and limited memory. This has made the Opera Mini browser the world's most popular mobile browser. 
And next, Mr. Lars Wallison is going to share his thoughts on the topic of leveraging web innovation as a growth strategy. Once again, please welcome Mr. Lars Wallace. Thank you very much. I will talk about uh, web innovation as a growth strategy. Okay, let's hope I have the right presentation. So <laughs> it's gonna be interesting. Okay. All right. So web innovation as a growth strategy. So I have to give you a signal for your turn. What's 
interesting about these devices is that there's a lot of devices out there, a lot of different operating systems. But that's only today you only need one web to access your relevant content. All these web applications you see up there, like Twitter, etc., they run on the same web. But you can access them from multiple different devices. And web technology is really becoming interesting for developers. HTML5 is really about to take off. Many, many developers out there are paying a lot of attention to HTML5. HTML5 is a very, very strong web technology which enhances multimedia, full video, graphics, without you have to access uh, these technologies through APIs and to use proprietary technologies. And that's going to be very interesting, something very powerful for web developers so that they can develop their games, their content on one platform. They don't have to do this native on each platform. It's very important. And a lot of companies are really investing in Facebook 5. Most of the most modern browsers, they already fully support HTML5, including Opera. Here you see the, the, the world we live in as a browser vendor. And you, as you can see that more or less everyone here in the room probably can find themselves up there. This basically describes that the browser has become extremely strategic. The browser is the way you access your applications today. It's not native anymore. Now everything is becoming web-based. The time where you access your native application, which run locally on your PC, there's so few of them left. People are using web-based applications today. And that means that the browser is becoming an access platform for applications and uh, programs. So, let's talk a little bit about the ecosystem battle. That's interesting. If you are an operator today and you do a reality check, you will realize that there are some big OEM players who are trying to take over your user. OEM players who have really found all the, all the pieces in the value chain and put it into one ecosystem. Players like Apple, Microsoft, Nokia as well, Android, Google, Blackberry, they have a complete vertical silos where they try to log in the users into their system. And they have everything from operating system, hardware, to a full service platform. So if you're an operator and you want to fight back, you need to find a way to offer the same web platform, the same service application platform. And this is just one example. This is, uh, if you look at our platform, we have, a, we have a web browser. And we do have everything on smartphone you need to deliver the same iPhone, the same Android experience. We have a full mobile browser, like you find on Apple and Google, etc. We even have something called Turbo, where we take away traffic from the network, so we do the compression on the server side, which gives you a faster browser experience. And we do have widgets and extensions, so you can run all the popular applications. And we have a full app store we can give to the operators. What is interesting is, if you're an operator today, you have more phones than just smartphones. Even though it's going towards smartphones, there's still a lot of 2 d phones out there. So, as an operator, the majority of your users are still on feature phones, still on basic phones. And what is unique about the Opera offering is that we have something called Opera Mini, where we have 120 million users every month accessing the internet through Opera Mini. That product runs on feature phones, basic phones, and we also have an app store running on that. So we can deliver this iPhone Android experience just a little bit better, and we can deliver it not only on smartphones, but also on feature and basic phones. And as you can see, within the last 12 months, these are the operators 
who are using Opera, Mini, and Opera Mobile to push their services to their users. So there's no doubt that a lot of operators have done this reality check and realized that there's some big OEM players who are trying to take over our users. And they have now teamed up with us and we are doing two things for them. We are getting people connected to the internet and we are pushing their service platform, their services to the users. And as you can see in Taiwan, we also have the Chungma Telecom, which I believe we launched three, four months ago. All over the world, and in particular, you will see many of them are tier one operators. Incumbent tier one operators who has got the wake up call that we need to deliver a service platform that offers more than what you get on an iPhone, what you get on an Android device, like on a device, and it's not only smartphone, it's the entire range of phones. It runs on all phones. And here you can see this overview, it's kind of interesting because I'm not just sure, I think we have been the biggest mobile browser for a long time, but it also shows that it's not only smartphones out there, Opera runs on all phones, and as you can see, there's a lot of feature phones out there still. So, on all these mobile users who access the internet through their mobile phones, more than each fifth user is accessing via the Opera browser. So, what else can the operators do in order to get this, out, this platform out there, to get these popular services out to the users? They have some clear advantages. They have operator billing. It really has there's a lot of issues with credit cards. In the emerging markets, people do not have credit cards. They have operator billing. So to extend that, give people more opportunity to use operator billing to buy things, also to buy things more than just software in terms of rank terms, etc. They can they can really help users to start buying things on the way. What's interesting about where the, the growth will be in the future. If you look at the growth in developed markets, subscribers development with carriers in developed market, it's completely flat. That's almost 100% uh, uses in, in, in mature developed markets. In, in emerging markets, there will be huge growth going forward. And what's interesting about that is that you can see that you are starting to have some countries, big countries, where people do not have access to the internet through the PC. They only access the internet through their mobile phones. South Africa, India, etc. India is a good example. In India, you have like 20, 30 million PCs, or you have 500 million mobile phones. So, when people are accessing internet for the first time in India, it's probably through a mobile phone, not a PC. I think this this exhibition is really showing that tablets and smartphones. Is really exploding, it's going to but I think it's more important to remember that in the real, real fast growing markets, it will still be, most phones will still be cheap, and most phones will still be in the networks. And this has some special importance for OEMs and ODMs, where we have a lot of in, in Taiwan. They will have to focus on mobility, they should really try to equip a browser which supports HTML5, so developers only have to develop their content and their games and their application on one platform, and then build this into the chipset, build this into the different platforms, in order to give users also a one click access to cross platform services. So no matter what device they use, they can access the services because they run cross platform. And then finally, of course, the growth is going to be emerging markets. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Boylison. And then we're going to move on to the last session of the
the day. I would like to firstly introduce um, our last speaker, Mr. Steve Owen, the Vice President of Sales and Marketing of NXP. He is responsible for developing business in new emerging and current market focused on the use of silicon and software solutions for security embedded and contactless RF solutions. Currently working within the following markets, mobile and secure transactions, payment, e-government, transportation, access control, RFID, retail, POS, PC readers, automotive, authentication, and smart grid. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Steve Owen. And then a short introduction to uh, the NXP. NXP is a leading semiconductor company focused by Philips more than 50 years ago, headquartered in Europe. The company has about 30,000 employees all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, Mr. Steve Owen. Um, what I'd like to do uh, in this, this short presentation is just take you on a journey uh, through the world of contactless technology and also security. So the two things you're already using today. So NXP is, is a company that came out of Philip Semiconductor's the identification business that I, I represent. Um, is a business that's been around for 15 years. We started off with uh, making RFID products and also uh, chips that go into ski passes. Those ski passes over the last the last 10 years or so have now come right across the world and they're used within 75% of all the contactless transportation systems around the world. So it's used in the system here in Taiwan, it's used all over China, Oyster Card in London and also in the Dutch transportation system. So many, many, 650 cities around the world use that transportation problem. So what we do is we, we identify people, 85% of all the passports around the world that have a chip inside use our technology. 75% of all the transportation products. 60% of all the RFID labels that are used now uh, to transport products around the world for companies like Walmart. And around 60% of all the RFID labels used in library tickets use our NXP technology, so that's the contactless piece. On the security side, more than 40% of all the bank cards that exist out there um, have NXP technology inside. And much of the, many of those now are either contact or contactless technology. So a lot of you are using MasterCard PayPass when you're simply paying, tapping and paying. Um, you're using technology from NXP. So it's very likely that, that some of you, and if, if not all of you, have some of my products inside your wallets, inside your handbags. You arrive through security in uh, the check-in in, in the airport, passport control, customs, and to get the MRT to here today, you're using my products. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> We, we are a company um, that, that in the last years has been focused only on, an, on most of the card-based business. So it, it transited on that journey to a contactless and secure product through ski pass, as I mentioned. So now you see you, we're in passports, as I mentioned. So it's, if you go around the town, it's passport, the French passport, the Dutch passport, the American, so it goes on and on and on. 85% of all those passports. The reason I mention this is it's security. It's the same reason that the chips are used in the bank cards. On average, people here in Taiwan have seven credit cards each, is the statistic. So all those credit cards contain chips from NXP, so they've got to be secure. Because every single day, there are trillions of dollars transacted in the market around the world. Trillions, hundreds of trillions. That single transactions taking place every day, the dollars involved. So with the ego of products, which require ultimate security, it's your identity. Governments want to identify who you are. You don't want someone else having your identity, so the product inside it has to be super secure. The product inside a bank card is the same product. It has to be super secure because you don't want someone accessing your bank account. Bank account. The bank doesn't want so you accessing funds that you're not entitled to. On the transport side and the access side, there are products that we brought out to market some years ago that, that are uh, low cost and accessible that enable hundreds of millions of people to be able to use the transport system every single day. Around 1.2 <coughs> billion people every single day have access to a transport system from NXP, the, the technology provided from NXP. Associated with all that, if that's not enough, we, we actually make the chips that go inside the readers. So ha as you have a card, that's then presented to a reader. And in point of sale systems, pretty much 100% of all the readers around the world that when you make that payment, 
use an NXP chip. And around 60% of all the transportation readers contain those products. So that's an important piece to remember for when I talk in a few minutes about the NFC revolution taking place in smartphones. Interoperability is the key to making this a fantastic user experience. If you turn up at a transportation gate with a car and it doesn't work, 2,000 people, if you live in Taipei, are likely to walk over your head. So the gate has to work immediately. So the car the interoperability is really critical. <coughs> There's a new move in the marketplace taking, uh, happening as well, so the NFC phones are going to come to market. So now the, um, the security chip moves into the phone, along with a, a, a product called NFC, Near Field Communication. And it's a contactless communication radio chip. It enables a transaction or a communication to take place to the phone and from the phone. You can write information to a tag, you can write information into a reader chip, you can also have information written into the phone through this NFC chip. You can have credit card information on there, you can have a transport information, you can have non-secure information. But the real key part is having the security chip inside the phone along with the NFC means that now we can move credit cards, debit cards, transportation, money and information about you as well as other companies onto that product. And the security is really critical. And most of these products as they come to market will have a PIN number so that the information is secure, it's your PIN number. So in effect you have what is it's called card emulation mode. It is the same technology available within your credit card today as available in your phone. Big difference that's going to start coming is, is that there's a much more visual experience, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, the visual experience of a smartphone as you enter applications. When you have a car, you've no idea what's just taken place. You know that you've got a receipt, you know you've paid, but you can't see anything. The big difference is now, with it moving into a smartphone, is you're going to be able to see the transaction taking place. You're going to be able to get a PDF file coming into your phone with the receipt of the transaction that took place. You will be able to see the loyalty points that you've just gained from making that transaction come into your phone. You will be able to see how much you've got left in your travel wallet as you make the transaction and enter into the transport system and exit it. So there's a lot more things that are going to happen with a mobile phone, and that's why the smartphone is really critical. The last piece in the business that we're working on and that is important, and I'm not going to talk too much about today, but it is something to think about. Authentication. Authentication comes in many forms, and I'll, I'll touch on a couple more later. Authentication, this is something we've seen um, challenges when you now have information and downloads and data stored on the cloud, and that information is coming into devices you have at home, such as a gaming product. You're putting your credit card data somewhere else. That information can be hacked, as some, some company found out in the last few weeks. So what we are aiming to do is talking with these companies about putting security devices into the gaming products, into the boxes that you have in your home, putting them into the servers at the other end so that the cloud then secure transactions are taking place. So when you're communicating with a games network, when you're actually downloading a game, because you're going to stop buying DVDs, you're going to be downloading games, you're going to be transacting on the site. So we're aiming to make sure that using the same technology that we have in the passports and the bank cards, securing the server side through the cloud, the transaction taking place, and into the phone, into the Wi-Fi device that you have at home. So those are some of the things that, that we're doing today. Um, and we've had a reasonable, so the last year or so, um, you can see on there, this has been driven by the government business, the banking business, the transport business, and we've seen a 40% growth in the last year. Um, that's, that's been continuing for the last two years, actually. This doesn't include any of the NFC business, which is starting, just starting at this point. So the mobile revolution um, that's taking place, the smartphone um, is the, rap the most rapidly growing consumer electronics device we've ever seen. So it, it is happening, we're all connected, we're staying connected. There's a lot of things that we're doing on the web now. We're making mobile payments on the web, actually, so you, you, you connect into those servers through a device, through your device at the moment which is reasonably secure, 100% secure at this point, it's software based. So you're able to connect to social networks, you're able to connect to uh, your friends, and there's a lot of applications that you are able to download. Remember those credit card details are somewhere else, not on your phone. What's changing is then that with an NFC phone, you can actually have the security and the data protected. And all those things that uh, are seen on, on the top part of the slide, all those things that we've been doing in the last 10 or 15 years, transportation, connecting to the PC, um, the, the payment, retail payment and government products, those secure devices are now inside the phone, along with the radio chip, so that you have a device connected to the virtual world and you have a bridge then into the physical world. So with an NFC phone, 
you're able to swipe and pay for things, you're able to hand the phone over to be able to then make a, a transaction, to be able to identify who you are. So that's a big change. And the experience is visual. You see what's happening. You see the thing taking place. And it's a big change. We also believe that because of this and the drive then in, in, into the marketplace, that the whole contactless technology will take a lift. It, it'll, be, it'll be a boost for the marketplace. In Taiwan, already if you walk around, and many of you probably do, you can take the yo-yo card, the easy card, you can use it to pay almost anywhere, 7-Elevens, you can pay in taxis, you can pay with a pay pass card. So contactless technology is pretty pervasive over here, as it is in much of China, as it is in Hong Kong, Bangkok, Singapore. London is now starting to wake up. The contactless card that they use over there, the Oyster card, is starting to spread. They've done a cooperation with Barclays, and that's going. Um, in, in New York, you've been able to pay on the transport system over there for quite a few years now with a, with a uh, MasterCard. The phone then allows you to interact with cards and with many of the things I've just described in a very, very secure way. The other thing you're going to be able to do as well is grab information from NFC tags, which are essentially radio frequency tags, RFID tags, grab information from smart posters, grab information in um, uh, maybe a Starbucks or a cafe that, that is on a tag, even the Wi-Fi tag, and I'll show you how that works in a second. So you grab information on the tag, no need to enter passwords anymore, because the data is in the RFID tag, you simply tap it and take it into your phone. Key point again, the radio piece will help the connectivity, the security chip is absolutely super critical. You will not allow your credit card information into a mobile phone unless you are sure it's secure. We aim to make sure that you are comfortable enough to do that. The market itself, so we, we have phones, we have the technology, is the market ready? So um, three out of the big four OS makers have committed now, so 80% of the smartphone market have committed to NFC projects. The Android market has already started because Google um, announced before Christmas that the 2.3 gingerbread platform and the 3.0 Honeycomb platforms all will contain NFC from NXP from now. RIM have announced um, a program that they're going to start launching later this year. Nokia have been shipping NFC phones for about five years, and they've committed that all their smartphones for the future uh, will contain them. So as, the, as they transition from Symbian into Microsoft, they will, they will continue to do so around that hole. And the last guys, um, let's wait and see. There's no answer, no information on that. But 80% of the market today that delivers smartphones have a committed NFC program. So it's, it's going to be sufficient to uh, stimulate the market. The ecosystem, this payment and infrastructure that's required is, is quite fantastic. So we, we co-created with Sony and Nokia this NFC technology eight years ago. In 2006, we formed uh, the NFC Forum. The NFC Forum was created to bring together many companies from the banking industry, from the telecommunications industry, and the handset guys, as well as semiconductor makers, competitors of ours to define standards, to define how this ecosystem would work, and to think about how we can put business models together. Because if there's no money to be made, no one's going to move this. The banks are conservative, the telecommunication companies want to keep their clients, the client is based on the SIM card, and the handset guys wait for the SIM card, uh, for the network operators to place orders for phones. So we've had a few years where we've been bringing these groups together to think about this and how to move it forward. The other piece is on the security. How, how do you then have a mobile phone that has no data in it and have your uh, security information like your credit card and the secure wallet and, whether, and other applications that you have on board? How do you manage that? There's a thing in the middle there called a TSM, a Trusted Service Manager, and that's a critical piece. So what we do is we will put in secret keys into a device, into a chip when we manufacture it. We'll lock the device and then we ship it to a mobile phone manufacturer. Someone else owns that key. In the case of Google, which announced Google Wallet last week, Google in the Nexus S 4G, they own the keys. They tell First Data, when you ask for a phone and you ask to set up your account, they tell First Data, when they've done the credit check with Citibank, to send you the keys to open that Google Wallet. So that's what a TSM does. So it's a critical piece of it. So you can imagine this, is, this has got to happen now it's going to happen in the US, it's got to happen in Taiwan, etc. So this is quite a piece of work for many, many banks, many network operators. And what you're going to see is city by city, and it's going to be the big cities, city by city rolling out around the world over the next couple of years. So what are you going to do? What, how can you do things? So in, in the cafe, you can go in with a mobile phone, you can check in, you can check into uh, um, 
the Wi-Fi tap-in in the RFID chip will contain the URL or the information for the Wi-Fi connection, which is already set up in the phone. Immediately you're on Wi-Fi, you'll need to type a password in. You can tap into Foursquare. Foursquare um, provide marketing tools for, for cafes, bars, banks, many, many other things. Um, in a cafe, you can tap in um, and, and the information is then sent off to your Facebook account. All your friends are told where you are. Great. So what that means then is they know where you are. Difference is with this type of marketing, it's personal recommendation. You guys trust personal recommendation from a friend more than you do the TV or the newspaper to say this bar's good. So this is why Foursquare are going to drive it. So not only is payment, transport, identification going to be an important factor for the growth of NFC, things like social networking and these type of applications are going to make this thing go viral. Foursquare are really excited about this opportunity because they're going to be able to tap and get to many, many people much faster. Yelp is another uh, restaurant recommendation um, application that exists. You tap on the tag, the website comes up with that restaurant information immediately and then you type in that the food was fantastic or not and then it's immediately gone. So there's many applications that are going to not be associated with security, not associated with a security chip. So it's going to spread in, in many different directions. In the railway station, obviously you're going to be able to check in and, and, and take a train. So that's a secure transaction, which is why it's got the little padlock there. But you're also going to be able to grab information about the, um, uh, the timetable, about a map of the local area. In London, they, tried, they did a trial a couple of years ago on this, and they had several stations where they're using mobile phones, grabbing maps, so they had a map on the wall, behind it was a smart RFID chip, and the information, you could grab it and find where you're going, because it's, it's really tough information to find in stations. So that, that's uh, in the station. In the office, because this contains a security chip, and it's the same security chip actually that's used um, in, for those rich guys in the room that have a remote keyless entry, BMW or Mercedes, where you simply walk up and the door opens on the car. It's the same chip. It's the same chip that's in your passport. So what you can have in here is access management that is highly, highly secure. So the company or yourself can set up a password and it recognizes you as you walk in the building. You can also use it for logical access, so physical access and logical access. You can use the phone now to access your company networks when you enter the office. You can use it to pay for a coffee in the canteen, or you can simply use it to buy things in, in the local company store. So there's quite a number of different types of applications, both secure and non-secure, that you're going to be able to do. And a lot of these things are already rolled out in some cities. The next part of the puzzle, so we make the security chips, we make the NFC part, we also make RFID tags. So what you, what you are starting to see is the requirement for RFID tags, which can now be read by an NFC phone. So there is, um, on, the, on the bottom right, you, you'll see that there are a couple of bottles of alcohol. In China and in Russia, apparently, there is a lot of fake alcohol. And the governments over there are not happy about this, so what they're doing is they're trying to do two things. One, stop fake alcohol being sold, two, collect some tax. So that what they're going to be doing is they're going to put in RFID labels onto these bottles of genuine alcohol. And you as a consumer will be able to read what's in there and see whether it's fake or not. Many people still buy fake alcohol, so you can still do that, but it, it's your choice what you buy. So the, so the choice is going to be down to you. The same thing is in, it shows there in magazines, in library books around the world now. Um, there are thousands of libraries around the world that have already moved for 10 years to RFID labels. In China, there's about 10 libraries that have moved over there. But also magazines, particularly in Japan, have already moved to having identification of, RFID, of, of uh, magazines with RFID text. You're going to be able to read about the information on the magazine about maybe taking a subscription. You're going to be able to read what's in the library book using this technology. Check into Facebook and also start the process for tapping into uh, uh, transactions from, on, through the cloud. So what happened last week? Google announced last week um, the Google Wallet. So what, they're working with Citibank, they're working with First Data, who provide the transactions, Citibank provide the banking services, Mastercard provide the infrastructure for the security chip, so they set the standards for security, and Sprint announced that they're going to be selling the phones, the Nexus, 4, Nexus S4G. We provide the chip that makes it all happen. Um, this is a partnership that's been coming together in the last year or so. We've been working with Google since July last year to bring the product into, into the phone. The Nexus S already has it. The 4G is the next, next product. Um, what you'll be able to do is if the first trial, the first rollout is in New York City and San Francisco. You can download the application from the Android market 
Um, you, go, you take the product in, you can then set up an account with uh, Citibank. First data, if the credit check works, they will send you the keys to your phone. You'll then be able to put money onto that phone behind a PIN number that's your choice, the PIN number. What we've been doing is making sure that um, the technology is both safe and secure and that the infrastructure is. It's quite a difficult design into a phone. There's lots of antennas in certain companies you've heard about problems with antennas on phones. Putting another antenna into a phone is, is not a small challenge. So we've been working closely with, uh, with Google. At the moment, across Greater China, we're, we're actually working on more than 50 different phone models with companies. So some have announced, ZTE announced uh, a phone, an Android phone will be coming out during the course of this year. There's many others are going to be launching either at the end of this year or into 2012. Every single phone, because of the shape, the size and what else is around it, every single phone needs a specific team to help design where the chip sits, what interference there is around it and the antenna that's designed. So that's where we come in. We've been doing this, as I said earlier, for around 15 years now in many different forms. So we're helping design the, the antenna to make sure the one thing you don't want is you get all this great technology, you take the phone, you put it on a reader and it doesn't work. It cannot happen. You will take the phone straight back. So that's one thing we're making. That's why it's taking quite a while now to get this out. That's why you're going to start seeing it in the next six months. So why NXP? We just bring a complete solution. So we bring to, to the Android market, this is why Google chose our, our technology. We bring a complete solution. It's the radio chip, it's the security chip, it's the hardware, it's the software, it's the firmware, it's a secure operating system which is certified by MasterCard, Visa, EMB Code. It's used by governments around the world for their passports and ID cards, so there's a number of countries already trust it. And we've shipped more than a billion, it's actually nearly 1.6 billion of the security chips. We are shipping in volume to Nokia and Samsung on the, um, the NFC radio chip already. Um, the Samsung chip, Samsung are manufacturing the Google phone. And we've got more than 600 patents on this technology, on the NFC technology and the associated security chip technology. So we're in a great position to really lead and drive this marketplace. So the Android solutions at this point are 2.3, 2.3.3 and the 3.0 Honeycomb are based on NHP technology. And what you'll start to see is that um, in that six or eight month time frame, you'll start to see tablets coming out with NFC technology on that we've looked at now, and a lot of smartphones. So what that's going to give you is a lot of great access through to the internet to be able to use services. I can't imagine someone using a tablet to access a transport system, but you never know. Um, the reason they chose is it's low risk, it's proven technology, it's been out there a long time, and interoperability is guaranteed with that technology. So, what I mentioned right at the beginning, it's a journey. You're all on this journey, actually, because you carry our products in your, in your bags, in your pockets, in your wallets. You have our passports, you have the security chips, you have the transport products with you. Um, you're starting to use them a lot more uh, with RFID, and you're paying with your credit cards, probably for the ticket for the show and your hotel, you're using our chips. Those products and the software associated with it now are moving to the mobile phone. And um, we're looking to a fund the next couple of three years as all this starts happening and we all experience like, do I really feel comfortable using this phone for payment? The interesting thing, so a lot of people say, I'm not sure I feel comfortable using, um, I'm not sure I feel comfortable using a credit card, never mind a mobile phone, to make contactless payments, simply tap it or pay pass. Many of you probably got a pay pass. Statistics don't, whether you like to hear it or not, statistics shown by MasterCard are that every single one of you that uses a PayPass card, on average, increases your spending every month by 14%. So you probably don't know it, but you already do. So the likelihood is, once you start using this technology, and you start tapping and paying, you're spending more. So don't tell anybody at home that that's what's happening. So that's, that's, why, that's why we feel very confident. When we've handed phones over to do trials in the last five or six years, in feature phones, which are, which are going to stay around for a long while, they are going to be in emerging markets, along with the smartphones. When we did it, the trials with feature phones over the last five years, we didn't get many back. So the trials have continued over four or five years, so we didn't get the phones back because people really enjoyed the experience. So that's why we're excited about this. This is why Google said, you know, just let's go. Let's figure out how we do this as we go along that journey. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you for your time. Thank you.